Welcome to the Vantage HR Influencers Podcast. This podcast is sponsored by Vantage Circle, the leading employee benefits and engagement platform. Hi, everyone. This is Rohit from Vantage HR Influencers Podcast. And today I'm excited to have Mr. Ramesh Shankar, who's the founder of History, a social enterprise to act as a platform to give back to the society. Uh, he retired as an executive vice president and HR head for Siemens for South Asia cluster. Uh, Ramesh is uh, also an alumni of Exila Rai Jamshed. So, well, welcome to the show, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Rohit. Thanks for inviting me. Awesome. So, uh, so can, can you talk about your journey and how you got into HR and uh, you know what, what, what were your experience in corporate uh, ecosystems? Yeah, actually, I, I graduated in science and then I did my post-graduation in personal management at the University of Madras and the Madras School of Social Work. And uh, when I passed out, uh, at that time, the option before us was in 1981, but primarily the government service or the civil services or the public sector. The private sector was still uh, not yet open and not very complicated. So all of us aspired to join the civil service. Even I tried a few times, uh, appeared for interviews twice and uh, ultimately didn't make it. So then I luckily got an opportunity to join a, a leading public sector of the Steel Authority of India. And I joined in 1981 as an enrollment trainee and uh, grew there uh, for about 14 years to become a senior manager and right through in HR. HR was my choice because I always loved to work with people and serve people in whatever ways I could. Uh, then after 14 years of journey, having multiple experiences, working in an uh, iron ore mine, working inside the steel plant, working in corporate functions like that, planning. I also was an executive assistant to the then general manager of and, and uh, all these opportunities gave me great learning in sales. But there came a stage where I felt I got promoted and I was not learning much. So that is a stage when I decided to quit in 1995 and moved on to Aisha. And I spent the next decade with Aisha in uh, Indore. The truck plant to come to. And then I moved to uh, Delhi, the corporate office in Chikibu. And then I moved to Chennai. I was with Royal Enfield of theirs. And again, moved back to Delhi. And I left uh, Aisha after 10 years. Aisha gave me a, a their foundation of HR. It is a company which lives HR and lives values every day in their lives. So it gives, it gives a lot of empowerment to employees. And it treats every manager, treats employees, uh, every manager. Is like an HR manager. So that is the great learning which I got from HR and how to uh, care for people, how to recognize people, how to uh, treat every human being with dignity is something which I really learned from HR. From then on, I moved to Britannia in uh, 2005 and I spent three years there as a HR head in Bangalore. And uh, the Britannia taught me what brands are all about. How do you build a brand and how employer branding can also be done like a uh, brand of Britannia and so on. So it gave me a lot of insights into marketing, branding, uh, even personal uh, branding, uh, the employer branding and so on. So that was a good uh, three years stint giving you insight into marketing and HR and uh, how you can use the insights of marketing and branding into HR processes and building up an employer brand. Of then I moved to uh, ABB and I was there for three years again. and. Uh, ABB was the first multinational, a uh, true multinational I worked with. So it gave me an insight into how to work, work across cultures, across nations, and how the differences are between India and uh, different countries in the world, and opportunities to travel quite a lot and uh, interact with people across, work on projects across countries. And, so on. and finally, I moved on to Siemens in 2011, from where I retired in 2019. And I spent the last eight years of my career as the HR head of Siemens for South Asia. And this was based out of Mumbai. And here again, the Siemens being one of the top engineering organizations in the world, gave me a great insight of how a great company with a, a humble background of somebody who started it uh, and uh, then developed it into an engineering giant. And how it has been in India also almost very good things and uh, serves uh, the best part about like Siemens and all the companies I work for are, they make products and services which uh, are all good for human beings. So Siemens also uh, is a company which is committed to zero carbon footprint, uh, I think by 2024 or something like that. And uh, so it is a great company with a high ethical uh, standard and it has made mistakes but learned from them 
and converted uh, every crisis into an opportunity and has become a uh, great leader. And Siemens and ABB gave me great insights into how multinationals work. Siemens being a German company also taught me how the German engineering and systems are so strong and how you can develop them into HR processes and make them, uh, uh, how you create a system by which it sustains itself over a period of time, just like a German car uh, drives on the road. And uh, so that was again another insight. So each of these companies, uh, Sale, Aisher, Britannia, ABB and Siemens uh, added five dimensions to my career and I think I'm grateful to all of them to whatever I have offered to my organizations. Uh, no, clearly you have a very illustrious uh, career um, over the past, you know, 38, 40 years. And, uh, uh, you know, it is um, very important in these times to hire high quality talent. You know, what are the top skills that a recruiter must have uh, uh, to, to hire high quality talent? See, I uh, personally, I always believe that uh, all recruiters and all managers look for two things. They look for skill and will. And uh, it is basically skills for the job and build is basically the attitude of the person uh, towards the job, towards his career and so on. So uh, I always give higher weightage to will than to skill because uh, skills can be developed at any point of your career or at your, any point of your life. But will is something which uh, generally gets uh, more frozen than skill. And it is not that people cannot change their attitude. But it becomes much more difficult to change your attitude to life or living or work as compared to skills. So I give a lot of focus to skills and how uh, wills and how you need to look for the right attitude of the person. And once the person has the right attitude, then you can build on the skills required for the job or required for the jobs. Keeping the current environment in mind, uh, I would add uh, two more things, which is uh, adaptability and resilience. Because the fact is that uh, the world is changing very fast. So our ability to adapt to situations, for example, today, uh, if digitalization is the buzzword, uh, how digitalization is impacting every aspect of life. And with all this COVID crisis, it is going to further accelerate digitalization. We'll see less of factories with people. We'll see maybe more of robots. We may see the more remote service stations. Then uh, physical people coming and servicing your machines and products and services, or even consumer goods. So a uh, lot of transformation will happen at the workplace. It will happen from the uh, marketplace. Consumer behavior will change and all this will mean that ultimately it is the ability to adapt to these situations, the ability to have resilience to bounce back because all of us go through multiple crises in life also. Some of us get so sunk uh, with the crisis that we are finding it, we find it difficult to get out of it and move on in life. But some people jump out of the uh, uh, bed and start running uh, as soon as the crisis is over. I mean, I would, the best example I would give is that of a sports person. Um, and you can take any of the world class sports persons in India or anywhere in the world. What you find is even if they lose a uh, game, uh, they don't sulk on that. They just, Try to look at the lessons they have learned from the failure of their, uh, of their loss and then move on to the next game village. So that's the way we have to create people, uh, employees. Uh, look for employees who have a great attitude, who are resilient and who are able to adapt to the environment. Right. And, uh, you know, in, in these uh, times, how important is uh, rewards and recognition for employees who are working remotely? In my view, rewards and recognition is uh, important for employees. Uh, at all times and possibly at these times it is more important than other times. So the reason I say that is that uh, many times people do not realize that reward and recognition does not necessarily cost money and uh, a pat on the back or an appreciation letter is much more uh, valuable than uh, anything else. Let me give you two small examples of how I realized over my career of how reward and recognition really touches employees and their hearts. Right. The first example was when I was in Siemens, there was a young employee who came to me and said that we used to have an annual conference of all the HR employees. We called it the shop. And when a young employee came and told me that I have an idea. And I used to be very excited when young employees 
whether within the organization or outside you right used to write to me or talk to me and tell me ideas i used to jump at their ideas and try to see that if i could implement them so this year my employee said that i have an idea this year for the annual uh, isha event uh, instead of recognize i mean we used to have employee recognition of course the uh, usual way of looking at the best employee the best teams and so on but he said let us do it differently this time let us ask every employee in hr to nominate one person from his family or friend circle who has really impacted or inspired him or her and made a difference to their lives and let us get those names and then he said that you can draft a letter and uh, in a one page letter signed by you uh, it should be uh, given to the employee on that day uh, in a framed uh, certificate and uh, a photograph of that should be uh, taken and then the employee should be asked to go and give it to that person whom who has contributed to his life whether it is his mother wife friend spouse uh, sister boss so uh, neighbor so we thought it was a very simple idea and uh, to be honest i never thought it will make a huge impact uh, but we did it and post that believe me or not we have about we had at that time about 20 employees in hr and i almost got 40 50 calls from mothers sisters brothers friends neighbors i got calls or emails to me saying that this was the best gift they have got in their life so far and uh, it was so simple it was just a letter head of the company uh, a printed letter and i had signed it nothing more but uh, and we just gave a small token gift with that the token gift was 80 100 rupees or 100 rupees value but uh, the gesture was so much felt and appreciated by these beneficiaries that they felt that this was the biggest recognition in their lives so since then i realized that uh, recognition is uh, not necessary it is uh much more than the monetary value we ascribe to it the other example i want to give you is that uh, i had this habit of uh, going around uh, the organization where i used to work and uh, whenever i used to meet some good employee uh, and i heard about something good i used to go and meet the employee in their workplace and appreciate them for whatever they did and i used to shake hands i used to even have a cup of tea or coffee with them and things like that wherever they were but then i realized that one day somebody told me why don't you write a letter to them and uh, while you do this you also give that letter to them so i started my handwriting is pretty bad i should admit even today so um, i started writing a appreciation letter uh, to that employee about whatever i have heard about that person and then i used to carry the letter and go to give it to that person uh, in a laminated form and believe me or not that person used to take a selfie and he used to say again the same thing saying that this is the best gift he or she has got in his life so again this has got uh, i mean if you look at monetary value of it a letter hit uh, plus maybe a few minutes i would have spent in writing that letter uh, it was personalized in my own handwriting and nothing more we didn't even give a gift or anything else along with it but uh, the employee felt hugely elated at this gesture and i realized that i could have done this uh, much earlier in my career writing a letter to people working with you was not a big deal but I mean, it's not a big deal for anyone but we don't realize that how valuable this can be possibly it can be practiced within the family it can be practiced in society uh, it can be practiced. so people used to frame it and put it on their uh, boards uh, frame it and go and gift it uh, to their family members and so on. so for me these were great insights of how reward and recognition is not only critical Uh, but it is absolutely uh, necessary to keep your employees engaged and in this environment where we are talking of covid and so on the people are working from home it is all the more necessary for us to pick up the phone and talk to people pick up the phone and appreciate people for what they are doing for example in my community in bangalore we have shut down the game and we have only five security guards and one uh, maintenance staff who is staying within us all our servants everybody has been stopped at the gates so and we are about uh, 40 villas within the community so what we have done is we uh, we find the security guards actually sweeping the garden which is not their job they bring newspapers for us which is not their job they carry our wet waste every day it's not their job they uh, garden the uh, i mean they water the gardens which is not their job they do a lot of things so just going across and and uh, thanking them for what they are doing and maybe we will give them a token gift at the end of i also intend to write a letter to each one of them uh, 
at the end of this uh, lockout period and publicly appreciate them for whatever they are contributing because it is not their duty at all. A security guard secures the gate uh, and maybe uh, manages visitors. But today he is watering plants, he is cleaning the uh, space, he is uh, dropping newspapers, he is carrying couriers, he is bringing vegetables for some people of the quiet elderly season and so on. So I feel these are small gestures which we need to recognize and it is all the more necessary for us to recognize when people are not in front of us so that they do feel that they are still loved, that they are still cared for and they will contribute. I mean, once you touch a person with their heart, your heart, then that person will touch you for your rest of your lives in some way. No, absolutely. You know, small gestures like uh, handwritten uh, letters to people uh, can really make a make a great impact. And, um, you know, uh, uh, you've been part of, part of some great companies. Uh, how would you describe the shift in hiring strategies in the recent years? See, the shift in hiring strategies are number, number one is that, uh, yes, uh, people are looking at diversity in a big way now. Uh, of course, it was there in the past also, but the ability to create a workspace where uh, not only men and women in terms of gender, uh, women are given uh, the rightful place uh, in the workplace and they are given the benefits which support them because our society, unfortunately, our social security systems are not strong enough for women to come to work and also manage their families. So we need pressures, we need uh, maybe uh, uh, the, uh, kiddie schools and so on and we need some spaces in the workplace uh, where they can support their kids and so on. So uh, a lot of thing is being done in terms of diversity. We also see uh, a lot of uh, interest in people, uh, people recruiting people from different types of uh, personalities. Like I know of organizations which look at MBDI or look at other uh, psychological instruments by which they are looking at people who are varied in thinking, highly creative to highly analytical and so on. People are willing to recruit um, people quite uh, not necessarily formally qualified. For example, I remember when I was in Royal Enfield, we had a, a guy who used to serve as tea uh, in our offices. And that guy was uh, not even a school pass, but he was extremely passionate about uh, biking. And uh, he used to come and tell me that, sir, I can service the bike and it was a bullet and I could do everything with the bullet uh, if I have given a chance. So I felt this guy definitely deserved a chance and uh, we invited him and I requested my service head to give him a chance, uh, even as a casual or a contract employee. Uh, they took him as a contract employee. He started servicing bikes and then the R&D department found that this guy is able to innovate on the bike by uh, playing around with the fuel injection system or playing around with uh, the filters and so on. So they took him into R&D department and subsequently they took him on regular roles. And believe me, uh, he was one of the most valuable employees in the R&D department when I left the organization. So this uh, is an indicator of the fact that now formal qualifications are not necessarily uh, uh, the sink for entry into organizations. Organizations are willing to take high risks and willing to give space to talent from across the spectrum of the companies. Right. And, and do you think the influence of technology has helped in, uh, you know, making better hiring decisions and uh, also recognizing people? Yeah, absolutely. Because uh, technology gives, uh, number one, it gives equal opportunity to every individual and equal opportunity for the organization to scan through the marketplace. Yeah. Earlier it was that uh, only those who had access to information uh, could apply for something. Or I remember when I passed out of school and I had to apply for college. I didn't know many colleges beyond, beyond Chennai because I belong to Chennai. And uh, it was very difficult for me to know something about XLRA or something about the IAMs because it was only physical brochures which were helping us understand what these universities and colleges and business schools provide. But today sitting on your uh, home desktop, uh, you are able to look at the world and look at opportunities across the world. Uh, that is number one. Number two is that you have a lot of these uh, psychometric tools which help us scan through multiple, uh, I mean uh, hundreds of resumes and are able to make a scientific assessment of people and make more objective assessment of people than before. So the human bias is reduced. Having said that, I wouldn't say that human involvement in decision making uh, will uh, go or should go. Because ultimately, uh, artificial intelligence uh, or any of these psychometric tools 
do not have emotions the human beings do so to that extent uh, ultimately an ability of a human being to assess and take a call based on this or assessment is going to be critical but technology platforms definitely help in uh, ensuring social equity it also ensures opportunities for all uh, equal opportunities for all it uh, provides uh, uh, a very scientific way of assessing people for example i remember in engineering colleges we used to physically go to every engineering college conduct a test conduct some group discussion and interviews that is the way we used to select but now sitting in mumbai we used to conduct online tests across all engineering colleges and one hour we used to finish the whole thing and uh, we could even do the interviews on videos and we could do uh, psychometrics uh, online and so on and we could uh, also ensure that people don't misuse uh, online or virtual platforms for making wrong identities and so on so technology is enabling as i said opportunities it is enabling equity it is enabling opportunity you know work life balance has uh, become the buzzword among employees and going forward i think remote working uh, remote work is going to be it is going to be even more prominent in most companies how can employers and managers find a balance uh, between work and life without compromising on employees productivity see here what i believe is that uh, work life balance has got to do more with the employee himself or herself and the manager himself uh like for example having worked in five good organizations i can tell you that i never had this issue of work life balance in my life or career uh the reason being that uh, i felt the organizations uh, even in 1980s uh, were flexible enough to give uh, uh, space for any emergencies in my personal life uh, at the same time when there were work pressures and uh, my family was willing enough to accommodate uh, the less time i used to spend at home as compared to the work space having said that uh, in a remote working environment uh, like the lockdown and so on uh, there has to be more self discipline of the individual uh, for, for example people have to get used to use technology have to be more responsive uh, in terms of basic uh, etiquette for example one of the things i find very amusing is that people uh, don't respond to phone calls people don't respond to emails right. people don't respond to uh, i mean don't get back to even don't wish back people wish you i mean these are i have recently article written article which i got published where i have said about how to be professional and these are the things i'm talking about for example in your work from home situation you have to dedicate uh, your work time and your personal time and demarcate the two very clearly for example if my office timings are 8 to 5 uh, and my lunch break is say 1 to 2 uh, 8 to 1 and 2 to 5 i should be sitting on a desk or in a space which i have allocated in my house for working and i should not be doing any other thing other than that except for everything so and uh, i should have this thing like yesterday only someone was messaging me saying that there are some employees who are working from home but they are not taking calls they are not attending on calls they are not responding to messages what should we do so so this is in my opinion high indiscipline because uh, here the best way would be possibly could be uh, that outcome should be clearly defined and uh, the target should be uh, delineated between monthly targets to weekly targets to daily targets and uh, there should be a good uh, communication between the manager and the employee and uh, this uh, responsibility of ensuring that there is a balance as i said lies both on the employee and the manager and to a greater extent on the employee because the way he or she is able to communicate uh, of course there would be exceptions where managers are ruthless and they may not uh, accommodate genuine requests and so on on the other hand there might be cases where employees also misuse work from home or uh, uh, other things or don't respond to customers or suppliers or employees as the case may be so it is a fine balance but uh, it is all the more critical and today you have technologies uh, which can help in also tracking uh, people working from home however i would say that we should depend more on trust and if there is a breach of trust that should be punished uh, but 
we should develop we should not enable technologies to intrude into the privacy of their homes we should uh, trust them and we should define deliverables so that we are able to monitor outcomes however uh, having said that if there is a breach of trust or if there is a la- uh, delay in deliverables or if there is no response to stakeholders like customers employees or suppliers uh, then of course we should uh, have consequent action absolutely and uh, you know lots of the modern organizations have and uh, now got to embrace uh, millennials and gen z's who are going to be the the leaders in the work uh, workplace and uh, gen z and millennials have a very different way of style of working and their ambitions are very different from from boomers and the older generations so what kind of company benefits and perks uh, do uh, millennials and gen z's uh, seek in workplaces See, interestingly, and this you will be surprised, especially because you are working in the area of recognition. Right. I always thought the millennials and Gen Zs uh, were not one of those who were very craving about recognition, or uh, they were craving about face-to-face communication. They were more uh, uh, virtual. They believed in virtual communication. They used virtual tools to communicate with each other, whether it's WhatsApp or uh, FaceTime or other chat. messengers and so on uh, when i met a youngster who i had talked with uh, from deloitte and uh, he joined siemens and uh, one day he did a, i mean he's a very bright young boy and uh, i called him and i uh, told him that you are doing a great job and i did the same thing which i told you earlier saying that i wrote a letter to him and i gave it to him and i said that uh, i i mean you should only three months since you joined but you have done what uh, what i have seen you have done a fabulous job and I like your attitude to the work. I love your way that you interact with people, the way you learn, and the way you contribute and innovate. So this, uh, then he sat with me, had a cup of tea, and uh, he was telling me that this was the best thing which has happened to his life. And he had hardly spent three years with the previous organization, and uh, he had joined us. So it just was the beginning of his career, hardly four years in his career, and. Uh, he was telling me that i look forward i never uh, imagined that my hr head will call me and uh, meet me and have a cup of tea and speak to me and give me a letter because in the previous organization he said that even my uh, i have never met my hr right. and my manager never had uh, he used to sit in a different location so primarily our communication used to be only on phone and uh, so never i got recognized by anything i did there. so Of course, I do not want to comment on any organization, but the fact is that uh, many leaders also are human beings. So, apart from the fact that we have to enable them to be flexible, they like flexibility. They like uh, contribution to society. They want outcomes to be uh, defined and not the process. For example, they want to tell, they want you to tell them what you want from them, rather than how to do that. Uh, they want uh, to be recognized definitely and uh, interestingly as i said they want uh, face to face recognition more than any remote recognition they want a pat on the back then they are not much bothered about value of money or monetary recognition they want non monetary recognition which re uh, established that busberg whatever uh, research he did and whatever theory is initiated is true even today that non monetary recognition is more valuable than monetary recognition so the millennials are uh, have been there in the past uh, all of us also when we started our career were millennials so it is not that they are new to society today yes the average age in india is low and hence the number of people who are younger are higher uh, so the ability i mean ability to create a flexible work environment ability to listen to them uh, ability to enable them to thrive on ideas ability to create an environment where there is no fear of failure and ability to pat them on the back uh, more frequently than others might help the millennials too oh no, that's a, that's a very interesting insight and uh, you know you been part of hrishti which is which is social uh, initiative what is the idea behind that as i said the idea behind that is primarily that uh, my entire career i come from a low middle class family uh, from Chichi basically, and then I moved to Chennai. My father was in the central government, and we grew up uh, with nothing at all at home. We didn't have a fridge or a TV or a 
washing machine or any of this uh, gadgets in our house we used to sleep on the floor and so on so a typical low middle class family which grew up uh, good values uh, however uh, thanks to uh, my parents uh, commitment to education plus the organizations i worked for my teams which enabled me to succeed uh, i think i had a good career uh, i had a very rewarding career and uh, god has been kind i have everything what i can dream of in my life uh, so i thought uh, materially and otherwise my family has been a great support my wife my son and daughter uh, my son in law my grandson so it has been a wonderful journey of life and uh, i am grateful to god and to everyone around including my friends family uh, relatives neighbors uh, my team members most importantly in my career Uh, who have made me what I am today? So I thought it is time for me post retirement to give back to society. I have assimilated so much of knowledge and so much of skill, so I can give back. So history is uh, basically in Sanskrit means joy, and the uh, this thing was that I can give some joy to people in life. So I am a certified coach. I also teach in business schools. I train uh, in several areas. I also uh, consult organizations on organizational development and leadership and so on. So I thought uh, I could do this uh, along with my wife and some friends of mine. I have some partners who I uh, invite whenever I do a project. I don't do it alone. Uh, depending on the area of uh, need, I take expertise from people uh, across uh, the industry and. Uh, I am, uh, as I said, whatever I earn uh, post my tax uh, obligations like GST or income tax, I want to promote a cause of uh, eradicating blindness amongst children. So that's the cause I'm working for. So I'm not doing a big thing; I'm doing a little small, but whatever little I can do every year, uh, whatever uh, savings I have, that is enough for me for survival and for leading a happy and contented life. So whatever earnings I earn post my retirement. Every rupee of that post of tax, I want to give it to this class. So that's the idea. I and mean, I am working with one partner organization in Delhi, which is called the Shroff Charity Eye Hospital. So they do a fabulous job. Uh, the doctors, the medical staff, the paramedical staff, they do a fabulous job. I myself have worked with them for a year. So when I was in Aishar as part of CSR, so uh, I have seen it a lot, and I intend to partner with them maybe a few more organizations, but primarily work in the area of children. And contribute my small bits uh, to give back to society. Interesting. And um, I quickly want to do the quick fire round. What is one piece of advice you would like to give to young HR leaders? See, uh, one piece of advice I would give is uh, the most important uh, attribute, not only as an HR leader, for any leader, is uh, personal credibility. So there should not be any gap between what I say and what I do. So the moment we are able to, and all of us have that gap. Whether it is in our personal life or in our work life, we commit something and we don't deliver. We promise our children that we'll take them for an ice cream and we we'll come late from office and forget that. Or anything, it can be as simple as that. Or you, it could be an, to an employee at the lowest level. I commit to a workman that I'll have a cup of tea with him, and I don't do it, and so on. So if you are able to bridge that gap, that whatever I commit and whatever I deliver, there's no gap. Then I think uh, a lot of other things can be managed. So I would say the most important is to focus on building up your personal credibility as your most singular brand image. Right. And do you have any favorite uh, business book or non-fiction book? See, I'm a great fan of J. R. D. Tata. So right. I read, I read a lot of his uh, memoirs, his biography, uh, uh, a lot of his writings. Uh, when he lived, he was a living legend. Where He proved that uh, you can be rich and you can be humble and you can be grounded. So that is one person whom I really admire. And, and, and do you have any favorite HR leader? HR leader is difficult to say. I mean, uh, I've had many great HR leaders I've worked with. Uh, so I wouldn't like to name anyone because it'd be unfair. Got it. And uh, what is the best way people can reach out to you and know more, more about history? Uh, I have a website called history. dot com, so they can go through that website and also write to me. I promise that I respond to each one of them. Uh, I have my email called, which is also mentioned in the website, and I've given I think my mobile number is also, so they can reach out in any way. And every person who has called me or spoken to me or written to me, I try my best to respond to them. 
So I may have failed a few times. I'm not denying that, but uh, especially during work life. But I try my best to respond to every message I get. So I will respond. I'll be happy to help the students or younger people in any way I can to uh, excel in their career or life. So I, I'll, we'll put that in the show notes. Uh, thank you so much for for coming on to the show and speaking with us. Thank you. Thank you, Rahul. Thanks for listening to Vantage HR Influencers Podcast. Please do subscribe to Vantage HR Influencers Podcast on Apple Podcasts and Spotify for new episodes.